Hello and welcome back to a new Dhamma video and let's start with the intro. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Homage to the blessed one, the worthy one and the rightly self-awakened one. And the shorter version is Namo buddhasa homage to the fully enlightened one and this is a way of paying homage to our present Gautama Buddha and so today we're going to be studying the Dhamma we're going to be learning about this awesome word called or this awesome word Appamara and that is a Pali word for something we know as mostly know as heedfulness and so I thought that we should try and get an understanding of how Appamata works into the practice of meditation and why it is important on the path towards enlightenment and attainment of Nibbana and so obviously uh, the best thing to or the best one to actually get to explain this uh, word to us and how to use and understand obviously is the Buddha and so today I found four texts and they are I think yeah, they're all translated by the venerable Tanisaro Biko and so I'm gonna just say thank you to the venerable monk for translating these words so we can have a chance at getting to listening getting to listen to them and uh, maybe get a better understanding of our own practice and the part that Appamara plays in the it should be in the daily life of a meditator and so without too much intro I think we should get into it the first text is just called the Appamara Sutta Heedfulness Translated by Tanisaro Bhikkhu. And the next one is also called the Appamara Sutta. Oh, the first one is from the, I think that one would be the Anguttara Nikaya 10.15 Appamara Sutta. And the next one, I will make sure to put the links below so you can check out all the text. And the next one is 7.31 Appamara Sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya. And then is that the Samyutta Nikaya 3.15? 17 again Appamara Sutta. This one is with King Pasenadi. And there is also this one. The second one is with the Devata, a female Deva that comes to utter a stanza in front of the Buddha. And the third one is one with King Pasenadi. And the fourth one is called the Aparihani Sutta. No falling away. So we should begin. Appamara. To the extent that there are animals, footless, two-footed, four-footed, many-footed, with form of form, with form or formless, percipient, non-percipient or neither percipient nor non-percipient, the Tathagata, worthy and rightly self-awakened, is reckoned the foremost among them. The Tathagata is how the Buddha speaks of, it, of himself. So the Buddha does not say the Buddha when he's talking about himself, he says the Tathagata. It means something like, I see if, if, can, if I can remember something like the the one gone forth or the one thus come. I think. Continuing on. In the same way, all skillful qualities are rooted in heedfulness, apamara, converge in apamara, and apamara is reckoned as the foremost among them. And 
now we're going to be getting some similes as to how this is to be understood. Just as the footprints of all legged animals are encompassed by the footprint of the elephant, and the elephant's footprint is reckoned the foremost among them in terms of size, in the same way, all skillful qualities are rooted in heedfulness, apamada, converge in heedfulness, and heedfulness is reckoned as the foremost among them. Just as the just as the rafters in a peak roofed house all go to the roof peak, incline to the roof peak, converge at the roof peak, and the roof peak is reckoned the foremost among them. In the same way, all skillful qualities are rooted in heedfulness, converge in heedfulness, and apamara is reckoned the foremost among them. Just, just as of all root fragrances, black aloe, black aloe's root is reckoned the foremost. In the same way, all skillful qualities are rooted in heedfulness, converge in heedfulness, and heedfulness, apamara, is reckoned the foremost among them. Just as of all wood fragrances, red sandalwood is reckoned the foremost. In the same way, all skillful qualities are rooted in apamada, converge in apamada, and apamada is reckoned the foremost among them. Just as of all flower fragrances, jasmine is reckoned the foremost. In the same way, all skillful qualities are rooted in heedfulness, converge in heedfulness, and heedfulness is reckoned the foremost among them. Just as all Weddle and Dogtown princes fall subject to a wheel-turning emperor, and the wheel-turning emperor is reckoned the foremost among them, in the same way, all skillful qualities are rooted in heedfulness, converge in heedfulness, and heedfulness is reckoned the foremost among them. Just as the light of the constellations does not equal... Oh, I'm sorry, this is a good one. Just as all the light of the constellations does not equal one sixteenth of the light of the moon and the light of the moon is reckoned the foremost among them in the same way all skillful qualities are rooted in apamada converge in apamada and apamada is reckoned the foremost among them just as in the last month of the rains in autumn, when the sky is clear and cloudless, the sun, on ascending the sky, overpowers the space immersed in darkness, shines, blazes and dazzles. In the same way, all skillful qualities are rooted in apamara, or heedfulness, converge in apamara, and... Apamara is reckoned the foremost among them. Just as the great rivers such as the Ganges, the Yamuna, the Achirawati, the Sarapu and the Mahi all go to the ocean, incline to the ocean, slope to the ocean, tend toward the ocean, and the ocean is reckoned the foremost among them. In the same way, all skillful qualities are rooted in heedfulness, converge in heedfulness, and heedfulness, apamada, is reckoned the foremost among them. 
And that ends the first sutta, the Apamara Sutta. And so now that we have this uh, very qualified understanding of how and what Apamara or heedfulness is, we're going to continue to the next one, the Apamara Sutta, Ankuttari Nikaya 7.31. Where a devata, a female deva, comes to see the Buddha. Continuing on. Then a certain devata in the far extreme of the night, her extreme radiance lighting up the entirety of the deita's grove, went to the Blessed One on arrival. Having bowed down to him, she stood to one side. As she was standing there, she said to the Blessed One, These seven qualities, Lord, lead to a monk's non decline. Which seven? Respect for the teacher, respect for the Dhamma, and respect for the Sangha. Respect for training, respect for concentration. Respect for heedfulness, apamada. Respect for hospitality. These seven qualities, Lord, lead to the non-decline of a monk. That is what the Devata said. The teacher approved. Sensing the teacher approves of me. The Devata bowed, the Devata bowed down to the Blessed One and circled him three times, keeping him to it, to her right, and then disappearing right there. Then, when the night had passed, the Blessed One addressed the monks. Last night, monks, a certain Devata, in the far extreme of the night, her extreme radiance lighting up the entirety of the Jeta's grove, came to me, and... On arrival, bowed down to me and stood to one side. As she was standing there, she said to me, These seven qualities, Lord, lead to a monk's non decline. Which seven? Respect for the teacher, respect for the Dhamma, respect for the Sangha, respect for training, respect for concentration, respect for heedfulness, respect for hospitality. These seven qualities, Lord, lead to non lead to the non-decline of a monk. That is what the Devata said. Having said it, she bowed down to me, circled me three times, and then she disappeared right there. Now the Buddha comes with his own stanza. Respecting the teacher, respecting the Dhamma, and with fierce respect for the Sangha. Respecting concentration, ardent, and with fierce respect for training. A monk respecting heedfulness, apamara, and with the respect for hospitality, is incapable of decline, is right in the presence of unbinding, which is another word for nibbana. And that was the second one. And... This was from yeah, Ankutari Nikaya 7.31. And continuing on. This is kind of the same story. Kind of. Uh, but it's called the same Sutta. Apamada Sutta from the Samyutta Nikaya 3.17. Apamada. This is the one with the King Pasenani. And here we go. At Sawati, as he was sitting to one side, King Pasenadi Kosala said to the Blessed One, Is there, Lord, any one quality that keeps both kinds of benefits secure? Benefits in this life and benefits in lives to come. There is one quality, great King, that keeps both kinds of benefit secure. Benefits in this life and benefits in the lives to come. 
But what, O oh Lord, is that one quality? Heedfulness, great king. Just as the footprints of all living beings, the legs can be encompassed by the footprint of the elephant, and the elephant's footprint is declared to be supreme among them in terms of size, in terms of its great size. In the same way, heedfulness is the one quality that keeps both kinds of benefits secure. Benefits in this life and benefits in lives to come. That is what the Blessed One said. Having said that, the one well gone, the teacher, said further. For one who desires long life, health, beauty, heaven and noble birth, lavish delights one after another. The, pr the wise praise heedfulness in performing deeds of merit. When heedful, wise, you achieve both kinds of benefit, benefits in this life and benefits in lives to come. By breaking through to your benefit, you are called enlightened and wise. And now to the last one. And we just read the Appamara Sutta from the Samyutta Nikaya number 3.17. And now we're continuing on to the Aparihani Sutta. No falling away. In doubt, with four qualities, a monk is incapable of falling away and is right in the presence of unbinding. Which four? There is the case where a monk is consummate in virtue, guards the doors to his sense faculties, knows moderation in eating and is devoted to wakefulness. And how is a monk Consummate in virtue, there is the case where a monk is virtuous. He dwells restrained in accordance with the Patimoka, consummate in his behavior and sphere of activity. He trains himself, having undertaken the training rules, seeing danger in the slightest of faults. This is how a monk is consummate in virtue. And how does a monk guard the doors to his sense faculties? There is the case where a monk, on seeing a form with the eye, does not grasp at any theme or variation by which, if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the eye, evil, unskillful qualities such as greed or distress might assail him. He practices with restraint. He guards the faculty of the eye. He achieves restraint with regard to the faculty of the eye. On hearing a sound with the ear, he does not grasp at any theme of variation by which, if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the ear, evil, unskillful qualities such as greed or distress might assail him. He practices with restraint. He guards the faculty of the ear. He achieves restraint with regard to the faculty of the ear. On smelling an aroma with the nose, he achieves restraint with regard to the faculty of the nose. On tasting a flavor with the tongue, he achieves restraint with regard to the faculty of the tongue. On feeling a tactile sensation with the body, he achieves restraint with regard to the faculty of the body. On cognizing 
an idea with the intellect, he does not grasp at any theme or variation by which, if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the intellect, evil and unskillful qualities such as greed or distress might assail him. He practices with restraint. He guards the faculty of the intellect. He achieves restraint with regard to the faculty of the intellect. This is how a monk guards the doors to his sense faculties. And how does a monk know moderation in eating? There is the case where a monk, considering it appropriately, takes his food not playfully, not for intoxication, nor for putting on bulk, nor for beautification, but simply for the survival and continuance of this body, for ending its afflictions, for the support of the holy life, thinking, I will destroy old feelings of hunger and not create new feelings from overeating. Thus, I will maintain myself, be blameless and live in comfort. This is how a monk knows moderation in eating. And how is a monk devoted to wakefulness? There is the case where a monk during the day Sitting and pacing back and forth, cleanses his mind of any qualities that would hold the mind in check. During the first watch of the night, from dusk to 10 p.m., sitting and pacing back and forth, he cleanses his mind of any qualities that would hold the mind in check. During the second watch of the night, from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., Reclining on his right side, he takes up the lion's posture, one foot placed on top of the other, mindful, alert, with his mind set on getting up, either as soon as he awakens or at a particular time. During the last watch of the night, from 2 a.m. to dawn, sitting and pacing back and forth, he cleanses his mind of any qualities that would hold the mind in check. This is how a monk is devoted to wakefulness. Endowed with these four qualities, a monk is incapable of falling away and is right in the presence of unbinding. And now the Buddha gives um, a verse or a poem and that's here the monk established in virtue rest restrained with regard to the sense faculties knowing moderation and food and devoted to wakefulness dwelling thus ardently day and night untiring he develops skillful qualities for the attainment of rest from the yoke. The monk delighting in heedfulness and seeing danger in heedlessness is incapable of falling away, is right in the presence of unbinding. Sadhu. 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 How wonderful. And so, today, and this concludes the four suttas we're going to read. So, summing up, we just read from the Anguttara Nikaya, we read uh, the text 10.15, Apamara Sutta. And then we read another Apamara Sutta from the Anguttara Nikaya, 7. Point three one, and then we read from the Samyutta Nikaya, uh, three point one seven. Uh,
på mig dessutom. And all the links to the text is going to be below here, so you can check them out yourself. And then we read the Aparihani Sutta, No Falling Away, from the Guttani Guy 4.37. And that concludes the four suttas that I had prepared for today. And I can just say that two of my favorite stanzas, I don't know why, but I think pr probably this one is one that I never forget. So let's just have these two read them up. It's a little bit funny. But, uh, yeah, so, so let's hear him. Uh, these two are from the first sutta we read, where the Buddha gives similes as to how Apamara is to be understood. And so this one is just like, I mean for me, it's just one of those things in the Dhamma you know, some of the things in the Dhamma, it just follow, follows you along and you just don't seem to forget it. And this is one of those for me. And this is also the one from the Dhammapada verse number two. It's the same one with that one. So this one and that one and then Dhammapada uh, number two, <laughs> the twin verse. Uh, I have a hard time ever forgetting those. They're very close near to me in that way. But let's hear him again. So, just as all the light of the constellation does not equal to one sixteenth of the light of the moon, and the light of the moon is reckoned the foremost among them, in the same way all skillful qualities are rooted in heedfulness, apamara, converge in apamara, and apamara is reckoned as the foremost among them. So with all the stars at night, with all of them, they, do, they don't even equal to one sixteenth of the light of the moon. And that is how the wisdom of the Buddha is actually. It is just like the light of the moon. It outshines all of the stars in the night sky. that's a simile as to wisdom, right? It's not even a simile as to how to understand Apamara. It is how to understand the wisdom of the Buddha, actually. It is not in this text. It's from somewhere else. But the wisdom of the Buddha is just like the light of the moon. It outshines all of the stars as their light only gives. It's not even equal to one sixteenth of the light of the moon. Okay, and so this is another good one, and I'll explain just why. Just as of all wood fragrances, red sandalwood is reckoned the foremost. In the same way, all skillful qualities are rooted in heedfulness, converge in heedfulness, and heedfulness, apamara, is reckoned the foremost among them. So this is actually red sandalwood right here. Supposedly it has some kind of scent, right? And this is white sandalwood, that one right there. And this is a mala. Whoop, look at that, I just dropped the mala on my arm. Um, we don't actually use these in, in the tradition that I follow, as far as I know. Uh, so they're like, uh, for modern Buddhists, so if you like, want to be a modern Buddhist, you should get one of these, and then you can hang out with the, <laughs> with the Tibetan Buddhists and uh, all the other Buddhists. But take a look at this one. So this is going to be the Guru beat, right? And that one. And that is a lotus seed, is what they call them. And this is called a moon star lotus seed because it's like the moon, right? It looks pretty awesome. 
And so, uh, as it turns out, um, that was actually what inspired me to do uh, this reading on Appamara. And I guess that Appamara was also what inspired the coming about of this. And I also had that one. And that's from another thing. And, uh, but yeah, so it's like uh, be heedful. And I heard that if you put this on, and if you sometimes forget that you're a Buddhist, then you can just look at it or listen to it, and then remember, go like, oh, I'm a Buddhist. I have to behave and be an awesome person. And so you can also use it for remembering. I used it for, I used that one <laughs> for remembering the, the wanderness, the daily contemplations. You know, there we go, ETP, so, Bhagavad, and then the, the Dhamma Vandana as well. Um, to uh, to learn some Pali. So you can count with these. It's not really spe anything special about them, as far as I know. Um, other than that they are useful for keeping time. Because they didn't really have watches in the time of the Buddha, right? And, uh, oh, maybe I should just mention the Dhammapada verse too, I was talking about. Because we're at the end of the video now, and I was talking about something which I didn't really comment further on. And so the Dhammapada verse I was talking about, which I can't seem to forget, goes like this. How is it again? Okay, so it is that happiness follows a pure mind, like a shadow that never leaves. If you want to be happy, you've got to be pure. And if you want to be pure, you've got to be heedful in the practice. And if you follow that path as laid out by the Blessed Buddha, then you're going to be coming to a point at which you're going to be incapable of decline and be right in the presence unbinding just remember to remember it's gonna really help you out and so there's one minute left of this video and I am going to go and meditate because I'm just a meditator so join me for a little bit 30 seconds of meditation and peace out